Hello, welcome everyone. This is going to be the penultimate video in my analysis of Owl's Moving Castle. I intended it to be the last, it's true, but I underestimated the amount of material I had to analyze. In spirited away, I only needed to talk about the movie, whereas here I'm technically reviewing two complete works, the movie and the book. So please don't be mad, I'm not trying to drag things out on purpose, I'm really just committed to covering everything down to the very last detail. And I try to be brief on each topic, you can see that through the shaders in the videos. Still, if you have any suggestions on how to speed things up, feel free to leave those suggestions in the comments. Or if you think it's fine, let me know that too. There are a lot of reviews out there that are several hours long. Some YouTubers come to mind, like Totally Not Mark. It's a start with a lack of feedback. It's a bit hard to know if I'm doing things right or not. Either way, for those of you who haven't seen the previous videos, let me just briefly explain what you can find here. In this study, Currently, with four parts, including this one, I compared the events of the movie All's Moving Castle by Studio Ghibli with the events of the book that gave rise to the story, also called All's Moving Castle, by author Diana Wayne Jones. I also draw attention to references to other works, speculate on sources of inspiration, explain symbols, reveal hidden facts, among other things. Basically, I talk about everything that has to do with the story of All's Moving Castle. Prequels, sequels, theory, symbolism, you name it, it's here. So far I've been making a direct comparison between the movie and the book, but today I'm going to approach things differently. The last video ended with a scene in which Hall throws a tantrum, invokes the spirits of darkness and covers himself in green goo, which forces Sophie and Markle, or Michael, as he is known in the book, to clean up the mess that the crisis has caused. From this scene onwards, the two narratives begin to differ greatly. I will talk about the book first. If you're only interested in hearing about the movie, skip ahead to the minute I will show on the screen. Without further ado, let's get started. At the end of the last video, we witnessed Al's tantrum, which resulted in green goo, in green goo all over the castle. Sophie managed to calm the wizard down with some hot milk and then asked him why he was so upset. Al admits that he has been courting a girl, but that his advances are not being as effective as usual and that a young woman is actually considering someone else. When the name of the girl in question escapes Hall's lips, Sophie is shaken. Hall is courting Letty Hatter, her sister. Michael is also taken aback, because he and Letty have been seeing each other and, as far as he knows, are very much in love. This confession by Hall is the last straw for Sophie, who decides that she will leave the castle and go to her sister Martha, who is disguised as Letty to warn her of the true identity of the man who is courting her. However, things don't go according to plan, because when Sophie opens the castle door the next day, she comes across a live scarecrow, who immediately and violently tries to force Sophie to let him in. This scarecrow, made of sticks and rags, has a turnip for a head. In the movie, Turnip Head is a benignant being, who helps Sophie on several occasions and who ends up becoming part of Hall's family, but in the book, it's rather an entity with mysterious intentions, probably with a rather horrifying appearance, because it causes such terror in Sophie each time it appears that her old heart almost gives out and she feels ill. Scared off to death, Sophie manages to keep the scarecrow outside and orders Calcifer to make the castle run. And so the castle runs, all day long, until night falls, which is us Calcifer so much that he almost goes out. It takes poor Calcifer hours to recover from the ordeal. In the next chapter, the Scarecrow makes a second attempt to enter the castle, and all himself, after driving it out with a spell, admits that Sophie had every reason to be afraid, as he had never felt such powerful magic emanating from anything. Now, there is a reason behind Turnip Ed's furious insistence on entering the castle, but this is a mystery that is only revealed at the end of the book. My first assumption was that Turnip Ed was after Sophie, who was the one who revived him, but the truth is more complex, we will get to that eventually. Thanks to the creepy scarecrow, Sophie missed her sense to sneak out of the castle, because Michael arrived in the meantime with good news. Letty loves me, she has never seen all, it was all a mistake, he cries, dancing with Sophie around the room. I went to market shipping today, and everything was fine, almost a bee after another girl with the same name, Letty's never seen him. And with that, Sophie makes two discoveries. 
First, the lady that Michael fell in love with is actually Martin, who is working at Cesare's bakery as Letty. Second, the Letty that all is courting is the real Letty, who is learning magic from Mrs. Fairfax in Martha's place. The fact that Letty has revealed a real name to Hall worries Sophie. Sophie makes another attempt to leave the castle. On the pretext that she needs some air, she opens the door and leaves, heading for upper folding, where Mrs. Fairfax's house is. But it's not long before Michael and the castle are on her trail. When Sophie confesses that she wants to visit Letty, the real one, Michael suggests that they wear seven league boots, since upper folding is more than 10 miles away. I've already mentioned seven league boots in the second part of this review, but let me go into a little more detail here. It might seem like common sense to you, everything I'm going to explain now, but I like to consider people from other cultures who might be watching this video. Seven league boots are an element of European folklore that allow the wearer to move seven leagues with every step they take. Considering that each lui corresponds to approximately 4.8 kilometers, the average distance a man travels in an hour, this means that each step saves someone seven hours of travel time. The term was coined by 17th century French author and poet Charles Perrault, who popularized a multitude of fairy tales, such as Le Petit Chaperon Rouge, Little Red Riding Hood, La Belle au Bois Dormant, Sleeping Beauty, Le Chat Beauté, Puss in Boots, Cendrillon, Cinderella, Le Barbe Blue, Blue Beard, and Le Petit Possette, Little Thumb. The Seven League Boots appear in the later tale. The protagonist is a man, the youngest of seven children, who, because he is so small, is known as Little Thumb. His parents decide to abandon him and his siblings in the forest, as they have nothing to feed them. Little Thumb and his brothers arrive at an ogre's castle, and there to ask for food and shelter. The ogre lets them in, but Little Thumb knows that he intends to eat them as soon as night falls. Therefore, Little Thumb exchanges his and his brothers' heads for the crowns of the resident princesses, causing the ogre to devour his own daughters by mistake. Then he steals the ogre's magic boots, the Seven League Boots, and uses them to make his fortune. Well, Seven Leagues is approximately 18 miles, but in John's book, Michael explains that each step with the boots only covers 10 and a half miles. I don't know why John's decided on this number. In any case, Sophie and Michael are soon in front of Mrs. Fairfax's house. When she opens the door, a large collie dog comes running out and starts destroying the flowers in the yard. This dog, despite the difference in appearance, is the same skinny grey dog that Sophie rescued at the beginning of the story. And it's not a dog at all, but a man who has been cursed by the Witch of the Waste, fated to live in a canyon skin that constantly changes shape. Despite the cruel spell, Letty feels compassion, and the dog man is very loyal to her. We'll come back to this later. Michael and Sophie see Al and Letty under a grove of flowering apple trees. Letty is not disguised as Martin. It turns out that Mrs. Fairfax saw through the disguise from the start, but instead of unmasking the two girls, she agreed to teach Letty magic instead of Martha, recognizing her talent, intelligence and willingness to learn. As such, while Martha still needs to disguise herself as Letty in the bakery, the real Letty can be herself in the witch's house. Mrs. Fairfax sees all advances as something positive, and hopes that all and Letty will fall in love and that he will eventually become Letty's tutor, as she recognizes that Letty can learn much more from all than from her. Thanks to Mrs. Fairfax, we learn a little more about all childhood. In her words, I thought it was funny when he first appeared, saying his name was Sylvest Sylvester Oak. Because I saw that he had forgotten me, I thought I hadn't forgotten him. He had black hair in his student days. He was the last student of my old tutor, Mrs. Penstemon. In the next chapter, we learn more about Michael's circumstances, something that is never mentioned in the movie. It turns out that Michael, and possibly the Markle of the movie, after being left motherless and fatherless, was forced to live on the streets of Port Avon. As people chased him away from their doorsteps, Michael began sleeping on the doorstep of the then not yet famous wizard Jenking a place where he wasn't bothered because people said it was haunted. Until the day, all went out in the morning to buy bread, which led Michael to fall into the castle. And in the castle he stayed, without all kicking him out. 
as Old doesn't like to commit to anything, it took a while before Michael officially became a resident. The fact that Michael tell, told Sophie all this shows that the two already share a strong bond. Michael then asks Sophie for help in deciphering what he thinks is a spell, but which is actually a piece of paper containing part of Al's curse. A piece of paper that entered the castle because at some point, when she found herself alone, Sophie tried unsuccessfully to find out where the door led when the arrow was pointing to black. Oscars is found in a poem by John Donne, entitled Go and Catch a Falling Star. I've already talked about this poem in my previous video. Sophie suggests that in order to find out what the spell is about, they should try to put it into practice. And so the two set off to for the Port Avon marshes, in their seven league boots, set on catching a falling star. And one does indeed fall from the sky, but it flatly refuses to be caught by Michael. I would rather die, it exclaims, and throws itself into the black water, where it disappears in a flash of white. This saddens Sophie and discourages Michael, prompting them to return to the castle. When Michael sews all the grey piece of paper with the supposed spell on it, he exclaims, Gods above, but Michael, this isn't the spell I left you. Where did you find it? On the bench, in that pile of stuff Sophie piled around the skull, says Michael. Busy old fool, unruly Sophie, is Oz's reply. This phrase is a reference to John Donne's poem The Sun Rising, which begins with the question Busy old fool, unruly sun, why dost thou thus, through windows and through curtains, call on us? This innocent illusion shows that all knows the works of John Donne, and this can only mean one thing, which is confirmed moments later. All is not a native of Ingeri, he comes from the world we live in. All gets angry when Michael admits that he and Sophie try to catch a shooting star. It was your idea, wasn't it? He accuses, turning to Sophie. I can see you bouncing around the moors, encouraging him. Let me tell you, it was the stupidest thing he has ever done in his life. He would have been more than sad if he had managed to catch that thing. You caught one yourself, didn't you? interjected Calcifer, who had promised Sophie a hint. All makes Michael promise that he'll never that he will never try to catch a shooting star again, and then announces that he is going to look for the second half of the curse. Come along, both of you, so I can keep an eye on you, he says, and that's how Sophie and Michael end up visiting Wales. The house all adds for as a wooden sign reading Rivendell, a clear reference to the Lord of the Rings. All introduces Sophie and Michael to his sister Megan and niece Mary. He and the girl then begin to speak in a foreign language, quickly and loudly. Sophie wonders what language it is, and notices that it sounds like the one Calcifer uses when he sings a song that John calls Silly Saucepan. The song is actually Sauce Ban Fatch, a traditional folk tune from Wales. I will leave a link in the description so you can listen to it. After visiting the family, all goes with Sophie and Michael to the home of Miss Anglorian, his nephew Nell's English teacher, who is a stunning woman. All admits to accidentally exchanging an important document for his nephew's homework and asks if he can get it back. This is an excuse to start a conversation with Miss Anglorian and ask about the second part of John Donne's poem. But of course, all being all, he tries to invite her to dinner, only to be coldly rebuffed. Apparently, Miss Angorian is still faithful to her partner, Ben Sullivan, who disappeared years ago. When all hears the rest of the poem, he pales. The line from the poem, Write ten thousand days and night, portends that the curse will be fulfilled on the day of the Midsummer Festival, which marks ten thousand days since all came into the world. Midsummer is another European festival related to the seasons, as it is May Day, which I talked about in a previous video. You've probably heard of Midsummer if only thanks to the horror film Midsummer, which released a few years ago, which popularized the tradition. In astronomical terms, the solstice occurs on June 21, but traditionally in Northern Europe, the festival is celebrated on the night of June 23 to 24. Similarly, in the ancient Roman world, the traditional date of the summer solstice was June 24. In the city of Rome, it was the feast of the goddess Force Fortuna. People sailed up the river Tiber in boats to the temples of Fortuna. This date was Christianized as Saint John's Eve or Saint John's Day. 
It is usually celebrated through open-air gatherings that include large bonfires and banquets. The earliest reference to the custom of lighting bonfires dates back to the 13th century AD. In the Liber Memorandum of Barnwell Parish Church, it is recorded that the young people of the parish gathered on this day to light bonfires, sing songs and play games. The bonfires were meant to ward off the dragons that were on the loose on St. John's Eve, poisoning fountains and wells. Christians, on the other hand, interpreted bonfires as a symbol of St. John the Baptist, who was a burning and shining light. Here the book and the movie briefly cross paths again. In the movie, just after the green ghost scene, all reveals that he has been avoiding the king, but is now being summoned to the palace as Jenkins and Prendragon, his other names. He took a note at the academy, so he can refuse to serve the king. Sophie tells Al that he shall go to the king to tell him that the war is foolish. Instead, Al gets the idea of sending Sophie, as his so-called mother, to tell them what a coward he is. Maybe then Madame Suleiman, Al's old teacher, and the king will give up on him. Let me remind you that Madame Suleiman in the film is the combination of two characters from the book, the king's personal wizard, Suleiman, who was killed by the Witch of the Waste, and Al's former tutor, Mrs. Penstemon. In the book, the king isn't summoning all to fight in the war, but to look for his brother P Prince Zestin. It is said that Zestin was very attached to the sorcerer Suleiman and did not take well to the fact that the king had sent him to the waste to face the witch. After an argument, Zestin left, never to be seen again. Let's start with a version of events that the movie portrays. Sophie goes to meet Suleiman. All offers her a ring to ensure a safe return and tells her that, she, that he will follow her in disguise. So when a dog appears to escort Sophie, she thinks it's all undercover, but the old dog is actually called In and belongs to Suleiman. The irony of the situation is that in the book, in a later chapter, All really does take the form of a dog to discreetly attend a funeral, so this confusion might well, might well be a clever reference to that. The Witch of the Waste passes through Sophie in her litter and mockingly thanks her for giving all her letter. In the book, the witch only suspects that Sophie knows all. Sophie lies, saying she is going to see the king to look for a job because she is sick of working for all. The Witch of the Waste boasts that the king has invited her to the palace, believing that it is a sign that Suleiman finally rec recognizes her power. The Witch of the Waste is then forced to climb a huge staircase, when the servants carrying her litter fade away by order of a spell. This is the first part of an elaborate trap, but the witch suspects nothing. She inhales a pink potion and gets out of the litter. It's not clear what this potion is, it could be an energy infusion or something the witch inhales to stay young, but the fact that the fumes are pink makes me wonder if it isn't a subtle reference to the witch magic in the book which later, during a battle, evokes a cloud that is also pink. Admittedly, um, this might be a reach on my part, but I wanted to raise the possibility nonetheless. The witch therefore begins to climb the stairs, but it takes a lot of effort. Even old Sophie passes her while carrying in. But the witch isn't willing to give up, she has been waiting for the chance to prove herself ever since she was exiled to the waste 50 years ago. This is in line with the book, as we also learned that it was the king's grandfather who exiled her during his reign, and that the witch holds a grudge against the entire royal family for this. As she finishes climbing the stairs, Sophie turns and shears on the witch so that she can too reach the top of the stairs, showing her compassion. Sophie comments that the witch suddenly looks much older. In the next scene, we see that Sophie has given her her cane. In a waiting room, a single chair awaits them, which the witch immediately occupies. In leads Sophie away so that the trap Suleiman has prepared for the witch of the waste can take effect. In the greenhouse, Suleiman waits for Sophie. There is also only one chair, reserved for Sophie, which means that the witch of the waste was never meant to make it so far. Sophie is invited to sit down. Suleiman tells her that all was her last apprentice, a jewel, the one she wanted to be her heir but a demon stole his art. She warns that if all continues to use his magic for selfish ends, he will end up becoming like the Witch of the Waste. The servants arrive with the Witch of the Waste, which is old and stripped of her powers and responsive. Suleiman has given her back her true age. She explains that the witch made a contract with a demon, which ended up consuming her, 
and that she therefore needed to be exercised. She then reveals all as two options, give himself up, serve the kingdom and let them teach him how to get rid of his demon or be captured and stripped of his powers. Sophie is furious and points out Suleiman's sneaky behavior. She defends Owl, admitting that he is selfish, cowardly and unpredictable, but that he is kind and just wants to be free. Sophie returns fully to her younger self for a moment, which doesn't go unnoticed by Suleiman. Owl appears disguised as the king. While in camouflage, he addresses the issue of the war seriously and warns that although Suleiman's magic protects the palace from bombs, they fall on people's homes. This attitude is very different from that of the real king, as we realize when he arrives in the room, as excited and enthusiastic about the war as a child talking about a video game. The realization that Suleiman hasn't been fooled for a second brings some embarrassment to the room. Suleiman then declares that she won't let Owl escape and uses magic to turn the greenhouse into a place of illusions. The sorceress tries to bring out the monster inside Owl, but Sophie saves him by covering his eyes. The music that plays in this scene, which consists of several star children, demons, singing while making a circle, is a famous Bulgarian national song called Tren da Filsheto. I will leave a link in the description so you can listen to it. One possible translation is as follows. Beautiful like a rose, beautiful like a ghost Mary. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. If you like me, you should come to me. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. I will bring you to Novi Pazar. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. There I will buy you gold threaded saya. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. You will be wearing it, I will be beholding you. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. I will be beholding you to see if it fits you well. O oh Donna, your dearest to your mother. Miyazaki may have chosen this song simply because it sounds supernatural, like some kind of mantra, but we mustn't forget that Suleiman has a great fondness of for all, the most precious of her students, so much that she is surrounded by servants who look like a young version of all. As part of a Q&A session, the film's producer, Toshio Suzuki, revealed that both the Witch of the Waste and Madame Suleiman believe that they have a right to all's art, but that he ends up rejecting both of them. So the Witch of the Waste pursues him and Madame Suleiman keeps servants with his appearance. In the same Q&A section, Toshio Suzuki also mentions a short film called Oshi o Katai, The Day I Bought a Star referring to it as a brief prequel dedicated to all childhood, which is somewhat true, but not exactly. Oshio Katai is a 16-minute film written and directed by Miyazaki, produced by Studio Ghibli and released in 2006, and is one of 10 short films that can only be seen either at the Saturn Theatre of the Ghibli Museum or at the Orion Theatre of Ghibli Park. The 10 films are presented on a rotating basis and are The Whale Ant, Koro's Big Day Out, May and the Kitten Buzz, Water Spider Momon, The Day I Bought a Star, Looking for a House, A Sumo Wrestler's Tale, Mirtot and the Egg Princess, Treasure Hunting and Boro the Caterpillar. The film is based on an original story by Naoiza Inoue, creator of Upward Draft, a mural located in the central atrium of the Ghibli Museum. Naoiza also worked on the movie Whisper of the Heart, you know his paintings depict a fantastic world called Iblard. While painting the mural, Inoue told Miyazaki about his plans to release a children's picture book set in this world of Iblard, and Miyazaki wanted to make the mo a movie out of the story. This, the, this tale would become The Day I Bought a Star. There was some disagreement over the gender of the protagonist. Inoue wanted, to, wanted it to be a girl, and Miyazaki had envisioned the boy. In the end, Miyazaki got his way. The movie tells the story of Nona, a boy who starts working on the farm of a witch, Ninja, after fleeing the city. One fall day, Nona is heading to the market to sell vegetables when he comes across Scopelo and Mackinson, two strange men who are selling planets. Nona exchanges some vegetables for the smallest seed, takes it home and starts growing it in the shed of the window. Nona watches the planet develop, fascinated, but eventually circumstances force Ninia to intervene and the boy is forced to say goodbye to the world he has created. 
So as you can see, today about the star is not a prequel per se, but now Wiza Inoue confirmed Toshio Suzuki's words in a tweet. Suzuki saying Nona and Ninia were all and which of the waste is something I heard directly from Miyazaki. He says, Have you made this detour? Let's get back to the movie. All and Sophie escape from the greenhouse. The witch of the waste and in the dog go with them. Some are quick to criticize Sophie's action in this part of the film, but you have to think a little further. What would have happened to the witch of the waste if Sophie hadn't reached out to her? Stripped of her powers, the witch becomes an elderly woman who visibly has a certain degree of dependency and needs a caregiver. But since she was the witch of the waste, if not Sophie, who would? She would probably be left to die alone. Some would say that it will be well deserved, but not allowing such a thing to happen is, well, it, that's what they call compassion. As for him, he jumped into the flying kayak without anyone expecting it. Let's consider options. Either Sophie would throw the dog in mid-flight right there, which would result in the animal's death, or before reaching the castle, she could leave it somewhere in the hopes that Suleiman would come and rescue it. And anyway, we don't even know if there are any kennels in Hungary. Again, sheltering a dog rather than leaving it to its fate, even at the risk of it being a spy, shows benignity. In fact, it's this quality that allows Sophie to overcome all the obstacles in the movie. Miyazaki calls it devotion, putting the well-being of others above one's own interests. Sophie's actions are usually associated with grandmothers, being kind and caring to those around her, looking after the house, but these actions are portrayed as powerful and heroic, and catalysts for great change. Sophie is not the only character to show compassion. Even Al, who has a vain and self-centered side, and the witch of the waste, who towards the end of the film almost destroys, all because of her obsessive behavior, find the best side of themselves, thanks to Sophie. Miyazaki tries to convey this message throughout the film that compassion is an inherent human trait that anyone can find within themselves. All leaves Sophie to drive the flying machine and concentrates on the mission of distracting the king's guards, who are chasing them, and some time later Sophie arrives at the castle thanks to the ring all gave her. Suleiman in the greenhouse picks up Sophie's hat, which was left behind in the commotion, thanks to the hat she learns that Sophie used to work as a hatter at a certain store. It is with this information that she manages to establish the connection between Sophie and Fanny, which is Sophie's stepmother in the book and Sophie's mother in the movie, and use the letter to set a trap for her later. In the book, before Sophie appears before the king, she visits Mrs. Penstemon, Al's former tutor, whom Sophie describes as the most refined and frightening lady she had ever seen, Talentine with an eagle face. Mrs. Penstemon is concerned about all, who shows signs of turning to the dark arts and gives as an example of one of those signs an enchanted red and grey suit that all uses to attract young women. Sophie realizes that for the first time that she has powers and that it was she who inadvertently cast a spell on our suit by talking to it while mending it. She says that he came from a foreign land, Wales, and that he was her last and best pupil. We also learned that it was Mrs. Penstemon who taught magic to the wizard Suleiman, who coincidentally came from Wales like all. There he was called Benjamin Sullivan. Sophie admits that all has made a kind of contract with a fire demon, and Mrs. Penstemon tasks Sophie with breaking the contract. To get to the castle, Sophie is forced to climb a huge staircase, where a soldier stands sentry every six steps. When she finds herself in front of the king, she begins to tarnish All's name, but her words only make matters worse. Between insults, she admits that All doesn't care about money, and that he shows kindness to poor people by charging them less than he should. Thank you, Mrs. Pendragon. I was afraid it was someone who couldn't resist showing off or will do anything for money, but you have shown me that he is exactly the man I need. Tell Wizard All, Mrs. Pendragon, that I am appointing him Royal Wizard from now on, declares the king. As if Sophie's day wasn't going badly enough, on her way back she meets the Witch of the Waste, who recognizes her. If you're thinking of visiting Mrs. Penstemon, you can save yourself the trouble, says the witch to Sophie. The old woman is dead. She refused to tell me where someone I wanted to find was. 
When pressed to reveal where she is going, Sophie is forced to lie and says she is heading to the palace for an audience with the king. Suspicious, the witch escorts her, and once again Sophie is forced to climb the long staircase. In Sophie's words, I think the king got sick of me turning up and blackening your name. I went twice. Everything went wrong, and I met the witch on her way from killing Mrs. Spenstemon. What a day! And that concludes the video. I hope to see you in the final segment. This time I am very sure it will be the last one, because all that is left to cover is the last chapters of the book, the transformation of the castle, and the end of the movie. So, take care, and until next time!